Now, the Social Democrats have a new leader. Holly Carnes took over from Roshan Shortall and Catherine Murphy and today said she's unashamedly ambitious about the future. And Holly joins me live now in studio. Uh, thanks. It's been the end of a busy day for you today, Holly. We appreciate you joining us in studio tonight. Um, I think, um, you know, when you addressed uh, members of your party um, as well as the media today, you said, you know, I don't fit the stereotype the stereotype as a leader of a political party in this country. And I think people will find that refreshing. However, it is fascinating seeing as you ran, first ran uh, for a county council seat uh, just four years ago, and you say you are unashamedly ambitious, as we mentioned there. So was it always the goal, despite not fitting the stereotype, was it always the goal to lead the party? No, it's the truth. Um... I never saw myself as a leader of a political party or perhaps anything, if I'm honest. Um, I have to say I never saw myself as being a county councillor or a TD either. Um, but that's what happened. You know, I was kind of, I think for a lot of people this might sound so obvious, but for me, I really had a light bulb moment during the Repeal the Eighth campaign. I'd kind of maybe been engaged through marriage equality and then really got stuck into repeal. And for me, it was that light bulb moment that actually knocking on doors, asking for votes is how you affect change. And I was talking about this today to imagine that from that moment to here today, how am I standing in front of my parliamentary party colleagues as the next leader? It's difficult for me to believe. Um, but I suppose that is how I got here. It's through all of those different kind of knock on effects. And I think the reason that I then decided to actually go for it and give it absolutely everything now is that I think this is the time in Irish politics that the tide is turning. And for a party like ours to grow, we need to reach people who, like I was only four years ago, don't necessarily see themselves as somebody who gets involved, who even votes necessarily, all of these different things. And I hope that because of that, I'm well placed to reach people who at home, like me, I remember watching The Tonight Show and thinking, I feel so unrepresented. Uh, so what do you want to bring the party uh, that hasn't been achieved to date? Where, where do you want to bring the party exactly? You're talking about those people who, who don't vote, who don't feel like they have a political home. Um, are, are you reaching out specifically to them? Where do you want to go that, you know, Roshan Shortall, Catherine Murphy hasn't done to date? Roshan and Catherine built an incredible foundation, you know, to start the party only eight years ago. After mm. five years, they had... 21 councillors, six TDs, we have 35 branches all over the country. So I'd like to build on that foundation. It's very much a kind of, I want to keep going and keep driving the party. But you must have an idea to bring something new. You must have ideas. Absolutely. I want the party to reach its maximum potential. And, you know... And how do you see that? I see it by reaching people who won't necessarily see themselves as being involved in politics. And honestly, it's actually not just those people. My honest belief is that so many people in Ireland actually believe in the same things as us. We just haven't maybe necessarily realised that that option is there because we've always had this option between kind of historically, it's been, you know, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael and the kind of civil war aspect of the Irish history, you know. And now is the time it's changing. People are deciding what way to vote. And I think this is a time where we can really grow and reach those people. And my aim is to work tirelessly to do that. I feel very determined. And as you will well know, that is a very crowded field at the moment, if you like, what has been dubbed the soft left. Um, there are many parties that would occupy that. The, the Green Party would probably say they are, Labour would probably say they are, and, and then, of course, yourselves. And you have 21 councillors now and six TDs. Isn't growing the party a major ask? There's no particular safe seats. I don't think anyone should ever take their seat for granted. Uh, I remember when I was going for the election, people saying to me, that's the Fianna Gael seat. And, you know, it's a Cork Southwest seat and everybody needs to earn the trust of their sure. electorate and, but and do, keep it. Do you have targets in mind? Specific in terms of seat numbers, in terms of growth. So you're around 3 to 4% in the polls, as are other parties. Those ones I mentioned before, the Greens, Labour, they're all hovering around there. So, so where are you targeting? How, uh, how many seats are you looking at? Initially, like you say, the six TDs we have, I think, are doing an amazing job and we all will work to keep those seats. Then there's councillors in places like 
uh, Leash Offaly, we have Claire Claffey. She's the only woman in Offaly County Council. I think she would have a great shot at a seat. Councillor Lisa O'Donovan in Limerick would have a fantastic shot at a seat. Councillor Ronan Moore in Meath West. And, you know, so they're the, the, the start. We start with the people we have. We recently had Mary Roach join our party in Waterford. And of course, we want to build. If I knew a kind of exact number, I'd be straight down to the bookies. And I'm not saying that to try and avoid the question. I think... Like, so you haven't like set those targets. You've, you've mentioned three or four people there. So six TDs, you'd hope to have maybe 10. Like, would you like to see a doubling, you know, I'd like realistically? To see, I'm, I or, feel... or are you worried about setting targets because people like me will come back and say, <laughs> yeah. you know, you said 12. You said 12 seats, you didn't, you I didn't think, quite achieve no, that. No, it's not even that. I think, I, and I hate watching a politician on a TV programme kind of avoid a question, but I don't mean it like that. I'm not... I can't predict that at the moment. Like, I couldn't have predicted that like that in the space of four years I would have gone from knocking on a door for repeal to mm -hmm. the leader of the Social Democrats. So it just, I don't think we can really anticipate at this time where change is so in the air, what way it's going to go. And I think it will depend on how good a job that I do and the parliamentary party do in terms of reaching other people, how quickly we can find candidates and build on them. It's no easy feat. You categorically said no to a merger with the Labour Party today. You, you stated that now you got a lot of support from um, your Social Democrat supporters who were in the room. But you cited their time in government as breaking the trust that it had with the Irish people. Is that where you see then the key difference uh, between your party and the Labour Party? They spent time in government and Social Democrats obviously haven't. I don't think it's necessarily just about spending time in government, but it's how you approach that task and I think... But if the Social Democrats ha haven't had the chance to spend that time in government or haven't been challenged with spending that time in government as what would be a smaller, much smaller coalition partner, um, you know, can you really say that you would be any different? Yes, I can. And I mean that. I, I really, really do. I think, you know, Roisin Shortall was in government before and she left on a point of principle to mm. do with where healthcare facilities were being built, you know, in relation to where people wanted to get votes rather than where perhaps they were needed. And that is the kind of approach that we need. And that is the kind of honest politics that the Social Democrats were built on. So that if you were in government, you would leave government on a point of principle like that? You would have if you were the leader of the Labour Party at the time, you would have been gone? We would have ensured that our policies would be implemented. At least you have your red lines. You go into a programme for government and you know at that point, is it worth it? You know, you don't go in for the sake of making up the numbers. You don't go along with another party policy that isn't mm. what you've promised your voters. Because the, I think the really important thing here is that trust is the most important it commodity is. in And politics. all political parties will say that. That is ultimately what they want to have. They're not going to get seats if they don't have the, the trust of the electorate. But I want to, what I want to ask mm. you is then, what, what are your red lines? What would your red lines be in government? Because you do want to be a viable part of a government. You have stated that as one of your party aims as leader. 100% we want to go into government. I didn't go into politics to stay in opposition, although I've realised the value of opposition being in it. We are determined to govern. Um, red lines, I mean... Housing is a huge issue. My generation is mm. completely locked out of home ownership at the moment. And, you know, that is a very much a red line issue. But I think for people sitting at home, I'm so conscious that when I say priorities for us are housing, health, climate, every political party is saying this. They are. So if I can just give maybe a particular example rather mm. than saying the same kind of jargon that we're so bored of hearing. I think, for example, the government will say the same thing in a way as me. I think we need to build more social affordable homes. I think we need to tackle vacancy and dereliction. An example, the government introduced their vacancy and dereliction tax at 0.3%, whilst in house price inflation was at 10%. That's like saying to somebody who owns a vacant or derelict property, I'll go on, you know, like a little nudge in that direction. That's not punitive. Okay, so, so that in would a programme be, for government, so, 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 so tackling 10, vacant homes tax would be a, a sort of a red line. And if that's absolutely. not Absolutely. If that's Slaunch not achieved. Care is a red line. Real climate action is a red Although line. Although Slauncha Care, yeah. uh, arguably, you know, the government have set out their stall that they are trying to push for that. There are challenges when you are within government. The question I'm asking mm. is, say, if you want to be a viable part of government, are you saying no to going in with Fine Gael, to fin with Fianna Fáil, with the Greens, with the current coalition partners? Would you rule that out? No, I wouldn't rule out going into government with the party. I think our door would be open to discussions for programme for government but we would drive a hard bargain because, like I said, I would not be willing to go into a government 
for the sake of because it, arguably, to prove that we would they, go into they could be accused and they are accused yeah. of breaching that same trust um, with the economic crash, with all the austerity cuts that, that came um, of not solving the housing crisis. They could be accused of breaching the same trust as, as you felt, you know, Labour breached with, with the public. Absolutely, and I wouldn't have a merger with Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael either for those reasons. But you'd happily go into power with them. Would I you would, in essence, not it's, 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 it's a deal. It is a deal. I, like, would just, I, would, I would talk to all of the parties. And look, truth be told, I think it's important that you talk to all the parties and listen to them because things change. You know, when the programme for government was being put together the last time, we were in the midst of a global pandemic. Nobody could have predicted that and you don't know what the results of an election are going to be. But of course, in terms of, you know, our policies and then the furthest away in terms of to the right would be Fine Gael, it's difficult to imagine how we could sync up in a programme for government where we both achieve what we want because at a very right. basic level, we think that the state should intervene to protect us from okay. market failures and Fine Gael want to privatise everything. Um, so everything's an exaggeration, excuse me, but th their kind of privatisation approach is the opposite to what because, we feel the state should provide right. those services. So do, you, do you feel there's going to be a change here? Because the party had the opportunity to enter talks for going into coalition in 2016 and in 2020, and they did not do so. So you, you, you would change that. You would say, yes, we would talk, we would negotiate it. We do see it as an opportunity. Yeah, and when the Social Democrats did speak to, I remember when they spoke to Fianna, Gu Fianna Fáil after the last election, Housing was the reason that we left those talks because I think it, 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 you're right to say that like when people are in government, they're trying their best and they're accused of these things. And I do acknowledge that it is difficult, that it's not straightforward and it's about balance. Mm -hmm. And you can't promise the sun, moon and the stars and deliver all of those things. But if you say you are serious, for example, about tackling housing, why would you introduce 0.3% rate? So we would be serious about getting specifics like that into the programme for government that would ensure action on housing. We'd have to really know and believe that those actions were going to be taken. Okay. And we'd have to have the critical mass to have that impact, which is why we're so determined to grow. Uh, you've spoken out um, before. I know you, mm. you spoke out with um, you know, uh, the group chat when you uh, explained about the online abuse that you've received and that an online stalker physically showed up outside your home and how frightening you found that as an experience. Um, and I think that resonated with a lot of women in politics about, um, about what, they've had, what they have to endure on a daily basis. And you said you might never have run for election if you knew that this is the level of abuse you receive. Mm. In becoming a party leader, is that something that you've considered now, that you are more in the spotlight, that your profile is naturally raised by that? It absolutely is something that I considered in making this decision. It was a big decision. But I decided that I absolutely wouldn't let it deter me. Uh, so... When you sat down and considered it, because I know you've had to shut constituency clinics and not operate them, so it has been something that has influences, uh, influenced and impacted on your political life. Mm. What, what sort of what did you have to weigh up? I suppose, like even in that, with that in that regard, in terms of constituency clinics, I still meet all of the people who want to meet me. I just have to do it on an appointment kind of basis and do it in a, in a safer mm. way, which is a little bit of extra planning and things like that, but it's absolutely doable. And, you know, I have put in place different security measures and stuff since then. And I just think the best way to address, and it, like you say, it connected with a lot of other women, not just women in politics or in journalism or in public life, but women all over the country have experienced kind of sometimes negative attention, stalking, different things like that. And, you know, stepping back from a role like this because of it, it just isn't the way that I'm going to step back from this. It's not, you know, I'm not going to be kind of defeated by it. And I don't mean that I'm going to kind of really prove a point. It's just for me personally. Um, I'm not going to let it stop me. In a way, has it driven you to this point? Has it made you say, you know... I can be leader, leader and I'm not going to let stop me because otherwise those online abusers win in this situation. No, I don't think it was. I mean, in coming to the decision about being leader, it was more... I was really thinking, why do you want to do this? What do you want to do it for? Do you reasonably believe that that can be achieved? And so is it worth it? Because it is a sacrifice in terms of uh, your life, your privacy and all of those things. And it's because I genuinely believe in the Social Democrats and the potential that we have going forward and the need for that kind of a party 
in the country at the moment. And it was more that things like that would have been coming into my mind as a consideration, but what about this, but what about that? And that consideration simply wasn't enough to stop me. OK, and briefly, People Before Profit has written to the Social Democrats, at Sinn Féin and to other left-wing independents to open a conversation about the formation of a left government. Are you open to that conversation? Um, I suppose we'll go into the programme for government talks after the general election is normally how that works. And like I said, we're open to talking to all of the political parties. But nothing in advance? No, I don't think there's any need. Or look, I haven't read the wording of the letter. It's been a really busy day. Um, but I will have a look at the exact wording. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure at the moment, but I think going into an agreement now, I'm not entirely sure what their, what their plan is, but I'll look into it. OK. Holly Carnes, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very studio. much.